Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Easter to everyone. It's so nice to see all of you. Welcome. And I hope everybody is ready for a resurrection lecture. Today I'm going to talk about resurrection and what it means and how we can take little mini steps today in order to say many years from now, many lifetimes from now, that we have indeed conquered death. That we can have continuity of consciousness, we can be conscious on the physical world, emotional world, mental world, and higher worlds, and be able to communicate with all of nature in conscious form. Does that sound fantastic? So that is really the story of resurrection, and it can be done. If one person did it, and we are told that throughout centuries and spiritual traditions, we have stories of men and women who have conquered death, who have taken higher initiations, and they have been able to have continuity of consciousness. Isn't that something that we all want and desire, so that we would no longer have fear, we would no longer have grief, we would no longer have sadness, but always be in joy and bliss. That would be a fantastic thing for me to feel on a daily basis. So today's lecture I'm taking from the Teachings of Christ, Volume 4, and the chapter is Chapter 4, Easter Message. And I would like to read passages and explain and teach from my insights from what I've gained by reading this chapter many, many times over the last several weeks, and I really, really love it. We are told that in the old Egyptian mysteries, six or seven thousand years ago, they used to take the initiate, or the disciple, into the dark corridors of the Great Pyramid for a special ceremony. They would take him, or her, to the sarcophagus of the king's chamber and put him in it. A little later, they would take the coffin with the initiate inside to the top of the pyramid and leave it there until the sun hit it early in the morning. When the sun hit the coffin, the initiate would awaken. They would say that the initiate was resurrected, that he had overcome the inertia and death of the body and had gained a new consciousness and new life. So imagine that moment. Imagine yourself in the darkest corners of the king's chamber. It is dark there. There are no lights. It's cold and damp. It's utterly deathly silent. And you have the ability to climb into a box and be completely at ease, physically. You're not saying, ooh, I'm sore here. Ooh, I can't stay for more than two minutes. I have to move. You can't. You are completely at ease with your physical body. Your emotions are calm and serene. There is not an ounce of fear in you. Your mind is completely quiet. It is not full of fear and foreboding what is going to happen. Imagine that. And you are able to climb in and you're covered. There are guides around you. You are not left alone. There are guides around you who will guard your body while a higher guide takes you as a spirit away to the higher world. That is where the initiation takes place, not in the coffin, but in the higher world. You are able to leave all of that behind, and you are able to go to the higher worlds and experience and witness and learn what is going on in the highest planes of existence where the great masters and Taras of wisdom work and teach on a daily basis. You are able to physically experience that. Physically meaning in the spirit. You are taken then, your body is taken to the top of the pyramid. Now imagine, how many hundreds of feet is that up? It's pretty high. All the way to the top, it's still pitch dark. You have no fear. You have left it behind. There are guards around you, but you are in total, total darkness in your physical, emotional, mental world and your spirit is soaring in the higher worlds, and just before that first ray comes up behind the mountain, that first ray of sunshine, you are returned back to your bodies, the top is opened, 
And as the sun hits the coffin, you rise. You rise out and you are now a fully initiated, fully conscious human being. You're radiant. Your aura is radiating in colors that has never been seen before. You have the radiation of your physical etheric body in violet and golden colors. Imagine these colors. Your emotional body is translucent in silver blue. Your mental body is lemon yellow, sparkling. You as a human soul have a deep blue color that's radiant from the core of you. You are in contact with the higher worlds, with your solar angels, so there's that white heat of the solar angels sparkling in you. And you're radiating in full glory. What does that feel like? What does that look like? Isn't that magnificent? And you are rising with the sun on top of the pyramid. What are the angels singing? What are the great ones saying? Here goes a son or daughter of the Most High who has resurrected herself and himself through death. That is a beautiful symbolism and imagine that as we go through these steps. And that can that be ours? Yes, one step at a time. This is the great mystery that is given to us in Egyptian mysteries, but fast forward to the 21st century. We don't have to climb into a coffin. We can be in the quiet of our meditation room, in contemplation, sitting in deep meditation and leave our physical world behind and be taken to the higher worlds in contemplation to experience the beauties of the higher worlds and see firsthand as witnesses, firsthand of the continuity of consciousness. Isn't that beautiful? So imagine what that would feel like and look like. In olden days, Christians used the symbolism of the egg to represent resurrection. This is a good symbol for resurrection because man's aura is egg-shaped. Okay? Sometimes this egg-shaped aura is crystallized like an egg. It's hard and man cannot come out of it through his consciousness or striving because he is cemented in his habits, glamours, illusions, materialism, hatred, anger, you name it. Add all the list of things that bother you and tie you and make a shell around you. With all these things he builds a real shell around himself. So if our aura is not radiating in the multicolors of an initiate, it is frozen. The beauty of our bodies are not able to radiate out. We have that beauty in us, but they're not able to radiate out because they're covered with blankets of fear, with blankets of expectations, of illusions, of definitions of life that aren't really life-sustaining. When the chicken breaks the shell and comes out, it means that the spirit or the soul in the egg, which is latent and in inertia, eventually breaks its old beingness. Okay, keep that word in mind. And becomes a new life. That is so beautiful. In the same way, resurrection is a steady progress to break your own limitations and hang-ups and eventually to be born into a new life totally different from what you were before. However you define that. The mystery of resurrection is the transformation of our lives. Transform it. Eventually we will live in such a way that every year we will not be the same as we were before. We will be more refined. We will be in greater light greater beauty. This is the purpose of our life. So resurrection is not something that happened only once 2012 years ago. It's happened over and over and over throughout humanity's history. How else would we have great ones? They resurrected. All of them resurrected. Resurrection in essence means to go back to your essential Beingness. This is again the key word that is emphasized throughout this chapter. It's not knowingness, it is beingness. 
It's not horizontal expansion of all the things that we read and know and go to classes and take courses. It is a vertical being. It's who you are. The story of resurrection is the story of the mastery of life. When stage by stage you master your body, your habits, your shortcomings, your lies and identifications with matter and eventually resurrect yourself. So it is God within you slowly resurrecting and gaining mastery over matter. So keep that image in your mind. Whether you are on top of a pyramid in a sarcophagus or you are deep in meditation in your room or you are out in the gardens in the beautiful campground, you are in deep meditation, you are able to witness the beauties and realities of true life. So what are some of these steps? There are seven given here, and I would like to mention each one briefly and talk about it. And at the end I will summarize and have us do a guided meditation so you can also think through what does this mean to you. How do I get to that point where I can be in quiet contemplation and be taken to the higher worlds? How do I get there? The first step. The first step is to have a short range vision. That's easy. A short range vision. Micro. Anything that you want. As I read through this chapter, I really came into the understanding that spiritual transformation is a democratic process. You choose. You decide. Somebody cannot impose on you an initiation, an enlightenment, values. You have to decide what is important for you. So it is a true democratic process. You are volunteer to join in something. You volunteer to change yourself. You define your life the way you want. That is something that is so important that the esoteric teachings are re-emphasizing away from the impressed, imposed teachings that came to us in the olden days. You decide what is your short range vision will be for the accomplishment of beingness. I see in my experiences that people who really try to change their nature, not in spiritual words or religious words or anything like that, but really try to change their nature, whatever that means for them, are the ones who are the most beautiful for me. It's not people who, have, who go through three, four classes of spiritual studies or religious Bible studies a week, or people who read 15 books and take meditation courses. Those aren't the ones. It's the people who try every day to change who they are, whatever that means for them. To me, that is the most impressive because I can see someone walking into a room, walking into a meeting, meeting me for coffee or for lunch, and they're sparkling because they're real, they're genuine. They're beautiful. They've overcome something, and they feel triumphant. Don't you feel triumphant when you overcome something? That's the spark that comes out of you. You don't have to say, well, Master said this, Jesus said that. Who cares about that? Who cares? At the end of the day, you're just saying things that you've read. But if you say to me, you know, I've forgiven my past. I don't want to hold a grudge anymore. I want to help people impresses me. I want to leave people alone, let them grow the way they want to grow. If my husband or my wife is misbehaving, I love them anyway. You know, what's the big deal? It's one lifetime. You see, isn't that beautiful? To me, that impresses me. Doesn't that impress you? That's what's impressive in our human life when we change our beingness. So, when I see people wasting time in knowing things, spreading themselves out over classes and classes and classes, over even in an academic world, one degree after another. I know people who like to get degrees, to go to school, take classes. Stop. Enough already. Go back to who you are and start changing yourself, your beingness. And it's just one thing. Create a vision for yourself until you, ne next year at this time. And what, what is that? that one thing that you want to overcome. I have a friend, a dear friend, who overcame something really, really important when she said to me, I've decided, I've heard this through many different people, I've decided that my children are their own, 
soul. They are on their own journey, and I must love them and let them be on that journey. I thought that was a major accomplishment. Don't you think that's a major accomplishment? Rather than trying to interfere and intervene and say, do this, do that, I feel bad if you do this, what about if you just leave it alone? And acknowledge that they are souls on a journey, and they need to experience the things that they're experiencing. That doesn't mean you don't help when, you need, when they need help, but you don't interfere. <coughs> you let their soul grow and express. <coughs> and that is the hallmark and the mystery behind a good marriage, good relationship in a group, good relationship in a business world, is to respect each other's journeys. Okay, so that's one of the beingnesses. Okay, you ready for step two? Step two takes you from the micro to the macro. You know, that's the, the genius of great writers, and they stretch you, and they pull you like a rubber band from one end to the other. The other end, the micro, is second step to resurrect yourself is to have a long-range vision. I thought of myself at the, my last birthday, and I thought, okay, I am now 66 years old, young. I'm going to be another millions of years old, right? In the, in the long range, that's nothing. That's just a little chicky, right? What do I want to accomplish in the next 20, 30, God willing, who knows how long I've lived, years? And, I, and that was really sobering for me, and I thought, there's so many things I want to do, but what do I really want to accomplish? your long-range vision for yourself. Here are some questions that are suggested here. Again, remember, it's a democracy. You get to choose, you get to define. You can ask, what initiation am I going to reach? Initiation means mastery. That's all it means. It doesn't mean somebody gives you a medallion. It's mastery. What initiation do I want to reach? Whatever that is, ask yourself. Second, what step of progress will I reach in this life? Whatever that means, you define progress. Progress may mean exercising every day. It may mean reading one deep book a year. Whatever that means for you. Going camping on a regular basis. Playing with your grandchildren. Whatever that means. What is the step of progress that you are going to reach in this life for the next 20, 30, 40 years? Okay? Third question, am I going to be a success or a failure in this life? You are going to define success and failure. Interestingly, the definition of success and failure changes in our eight, when we're 18, when we're in our 20s, when we're in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It changes, and it should, right? It should change. It shouldn't stay static. The more wisdom we gain, the more we redefine success and failure. When we're young parents, the most important thing is to educate and feed and clothe and house our children. Of course, that's important. But as they go on to college, have their own families, what is success for us? What is failure for us? See, that's the definition that you are going to give. So the first one was short range, the second one was long range. Number three, this is really important. And this is a keynote of mental and, and emotional health. Very, very important. The third step you can take in resurrecting yourself is striving. It's the increase of willpower in you. I have noticed that people who make the biggest changes and become successes and happy and fruitful in their life are people who strive and increase their will. It's not just knowledge. It's not just endless love. It's that willpower that has to be activated in you where you say, I am going to get up. I am going to do this. And in talking to a psychiatrist very recently, he said, increase the willpower and you are going to see change. In the old days, disciples in monasteries had to go out and dig ditches. They had to do gardens. They had to do weaving and painting and and, and so on, and they had to meditate, they had to be fasting, they had to get up at 3.30 in the morning for services. All of that was designed to increase the willpower. It wasn't designed as punishment. It was designed to discipline and increase that willpower. Again, we're a democracy. You decide how you want to change and increase 
your willpower through striving. Many, many years ago I heard a lecture that Torquem gave that I recommend everybody listen to maybe once a year. It's called The Most Essential in the Teaching. And he said, get rid of your books, get rid of the astrology and astronomy, get rid of the seven rays. None of that is important. What is the most important thing is striving toward perfection. If you strive and take those steps, everything that you need to help you on the path will be provided for you. Everything. And at first, I was shocked. I thought, well, why am I a publisher then? <laughs> I publish books, right? I give lectures. Then I started seeing, but you can't use these things as crutches. They are a starting point, not the end point. So in having a book and reading it, that's one thing. But how about if you try to understand it? How about if you try to implement it? That's going to take striving. So the third step to resurrect yourself is to develop your willpower any way that you can. Any way that you define it, increase it. Now, here's a word of warning. Don't increase your willpower over others. Okay? Your willpower is over your own nature, however you define it. It's not to become bossy and tell other people, do this, do that. That's not willpower, that's um, disrespect. Okay? You're going to increase willpower over you, your own nature. Striving is an effort to harmonize your life to your highest principles. You know what your highest principles are. It's not so easy sometimes to articulate them. I sat down and I asked myself, and we'll come, that'll bring us right to the next point, number four. How do I identify myself? And I started listing daughter, friend, wife, teacher. And the list was like this long. And I said, okay, so how, how, what am I as a soul? And I had to stop and I thought, well, what am I? What am I? And I kept asking that question, what is the eternal me? I'm not even Gita. I'm just Gita for 80, 90 years. That's it. Next time I could be a man. I could be something totally different. I don't, do you see what I'm saying? When you think about that reality, to become to your highest principles, so the next question for me was, what are my highest principles? What are those highest principles that I can identify myself with? And everything that is horizontal, I put into perspective and say, these are wonderful. I am a wife, a mother, a co-worker, a friend, a lover, and all of that, fine. But that's not what defines me in totality. And yet, when we look at ourselves, take this exercise and do it, especially in the next coming month, as we go into the next holy days of Waysak and contact with the higher worlds. Ask yourself, what am I identifying myself with, and how big is that list? And if I really want to contact my higher self, how do I articulate that? And one of the ways takes us to step four, which is very, very important. Take this very seriously. The fourth step in resurrecting yourself is detachment from your past self. See, we have built our life on our memories of the past. Consider that. Everything that's happened to us in the past is default. Great Master Tibetan says in Discipleship in the New Age, page 463. Fantastic quote. Looking to the past is the usual direction and the line of least resistance for the majority of people. Is that interesting? Of course it is. That's our memory. We don't have a conscious memory of the future. We don't have a conscious memory of the higher worlds. We don't have a conscious memory every day of the beauty that we are. Nobody reminds us of that. But everything in our life, the very furniture we touch and the clothes we have and the food we eat reminds us of our past. Is it any wonder that we identify ourselves with the past and how hard it is to resurrect ourselves to identify with the future? And when we look at the lives and teachings of great ones, Christ and Buddha and all great ones, they are always pulling us toward the future so that we can disidentify with the past. So you are going to consider that your life 
is identified with all the things that happened and did not happen to you in the past. That's well and good, but they don't have to be an, 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 a permanent spiritual DNA imprint in you. They can be changed. And you can start identifying with yourself, with your essence of who you are, not your past. Number five. This is a good one. The fifth step in resurrecting yourself is to clear your karma. <gasps> What's karma? Well, here's a nice definition. Anything that is binding you in some way and bothering your conscience is karma. Anything. Again, you define it. You don't need someone to come and tell you your karma is this, your karma is that. That is horrible. I don't like it when people do that. How do you know what my karma is? How do I know what yours is? I'm not in your heart. Do you tell everything that's inside you to other people? Never. Even if you know what's deep inside of you, you don't reveal that to everyone, not even to your husband or wife. I promise you, there are things inside of us that we don't even tell ourselves let alone somebody know what the karma is in our life. We don't know. So you decide what is your karma by finding out what is binding me. What is bothering my conscience? What is it? Be very honest. At that moment that your body is going to enter that silent contemplation, sarcophagus, darkness of the king's chamber, whatever that is, it's symbolic. When your body is going to enter that, ask, something's still bothering me. I need to clear it. Why? I don't want to deal with that again. I really don't. Do you want to deal with all the miseries of your past again? No. No, nobody does. I want fun new experiences, happy experiences. I want to create new memories. So you're going to think, what is it that's bothering your conscience? And if you don't clean it, what does he say? It'll come back and prevent you from future resurrection. Of course it will. Anything that bothers your conscience, clear it up. Number six. How are you doing? Good. Number six. This is really good. So there's six and seven left. I really like these. And you can see one step at a time. That's all it is. Sixth step to resurrect yourself is to create a manifestation of refinement. I really love that. In our family, refinement was always emphasized. Refined manners at the table, refined dress, refined talk. And that whole idea of refined speech is kind of being lost in our modern world, isn't it? People like to call each other really bad names. They like to disrespect each other publicly, on the internet. They think it's cool and wonderful. But that's, that's not good. Why is that? Because everything that comes out of our mouth has a color and a vibration in it. And you don't want your aura to be filled with that kind of ugly vibration, do you? No. You want to have refinement in speech, refinement in thought. Think the best of people. When you see something that is not good, think of the best in it. Create beauty instead of ugliness and goodness. You see? So you're going to look at refinement in the way you are speaking to other people, the way you dress, the way you relate, the way you serve. Not rough and self centered and loud and interrupting, but refined. Refinement, if you think of it, about it energetically, will calm your physical and etheric body, will calm your emotions, will calm your mind, and let your essence break through that hard shell. And as soon as we become rough and ugly, what do we do? We build a hard shell around us. So refinement is to remove all that from around us. Number seven. The seventh step in resurrecting yourself is sacrificial living. You must ask what you are really giving to life. This is a very important question. Most people only think about what they are taking from life. This is true in spiritual and mundane worlds all. What's in it for me? 
what can I take? People want a free class. They want a free book. They want a free gift. They want to be able to take everything from life and not give anything. But the first lesson of a true spiritual being person is someone who says, what do you need? What can I give? It's so beautiful to hear that. Don't you like to hear it when somebody says, what can I do to help? Tell me what you want. What can I do to help so that I give instead of say, give me, give me, give me. Why is that? Energetically, when you take, 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 all you do is add to your blankets, to that hard shell. But if you give, you're radiating out. And as you radiate out, you create an empty space into which more will flow. Okay? So we are not just talking actions, but we are talking energy exchanges. Through these seven steps, you can eventually achieve resurrection. The first signs that you are finding yourself will always come from others, not from yourself. Isn't that beautiful? Other people will see that you are becoming more and more beautiful, healthy, compassionate, and noble. They will see that some divine light is shining out of you. Thus you become a help, a service, a sacrifice, a point of refinement for life. People will see the beauty that you are and they'll want to emulate it. Sometimes we think that there's only ugliness in the world and only ugliness and crassness and lack of uh, civility is what really gets you through. That's not true. We are all uplifted by beauty, by refined behavior. People emulate us. It's so beautiful. Yesterday I went home after shopping and all of that and uh, our grandchildren had visited and left and um, I heard about all the stories and the fun stuff and then all of a sudden about two hours later I saw a little rock about this big with a little heart on it painted and put right under our flower vase on the kitchen table. Our little granddaughter did that. It was so beautiful and so moving I took its picture. Then about an hour later, Steve went outside and said, you've got to see this. I said, what? He said, come please and see this. We went out the front door, and there are three flat stones, each one about this big, with different I love you's written on each one, and placed right at the door of our front door. Now, she didn't point it to us. She's only six years old. She drew it with her little markers and decorated little stars and hearts on the stones. I was so moved. I thought that little angel just left little gifts for us to find whenever we wanted, knowing we don't hardly ever use the front door. We use the side door, right? Your Easter egg, huh? My Easter bunny came and left little I love you's on little stones. And it was so moving for me. I thought, here's a point of refinement. Instead of, Grandma, what do you have in the refrigerator for me? She left I love you notes on little stones. Now, is that cute or what? But look at the, the beauty of that child and where that child's beauty can grow, nurture, and, and become. Her radiance was not to leave messages or anything behind except on little stones that could be found whenever you felt like it, whenever you looked. And then I said, I wonder what else she left in the garden. So we have to go look because she probably squirreled away little other notes here and there that we will find maybe a week from now or a month from now or I have to ask her. But she's so quiet, so unassuming, just does her beauty. She is really a total beauty and that's how I identify her. As a soul, she's a beauty. She is completely in beauty, unassuming, and not in your face. She's just like that. Now that is, to me, as a resurrected child. Isn't that beautiful? So let's take now a few minutes, close your eyes, and let me go through these one at a time, a few seconds for each one, and just stay with me and say, what is it that you would like to see yourself accomplish? First one is short-term, short-range vision. What is your short-range vision? Close your eyes. Ah, relax. change in your beingness. Now step that out as far as you
you can and project 50, 60 years from now, 70 years, 80 years. People are living longer. What is your long-range vision? You're healthy and long, long-lived. Your long-range vision. What is the step that you are going to take to increase your willpower? one thing that you have identified yourself with from the past that you need to change. Disidentify, let it go and project it to the future. Detach from your past. Number five, what is binding you and bothering your conscience that is your karma that you need to heal and let it go too? In what way would you like to refine your life? do you want to give back to life? What is the most beautiful gift that you are that you would like to give to life? Now visualize yourself sitting on top of a pyramid The lid is open, the sparks of the sun are coming, going to hit your face. See yourself rising, full of radiations. And just see the colors scintillating from your bodies. Keep that vision, that image in your mind. We are now going to have Lou read a passage from Christ's avatar, plus the communion. And if you would like to take communion, you will be welcome. So Lou, please read something for us.